All right, good afternoon, everybody. This is um, it's great to have everybody on short notice. Obviously, the, the stardom has crowded this room. Or the curiosity at incompetence or potential incompetence has crowded the room. Uh, but we're, we're, we're um, now kind of make these, these meetings available to many others. So we're actually filming this. So if you speak up, because this is going to be more in the form of Q&A, please speak loudly. <coughs> that Gary and I are mic'd, but you aren't. So um, um, please speak up. But it's wonderful to have Gary here. I think probably everybody here is at some point in their lives uh, lived in a place where they read the SCMP every day. So uh, we used to, I used to get it delivered to my door and still do in, in, uh, when I'm visiting. Um, but Gary, now it's been about a year and a half that's about right. Just a little under. A year and a half ago, took over the, the SCMP, having had a great career in um, kind of, what would you call it, in, in startups, working in kind of startups in, in news aggregation. Is that the right term? That was the last thing I did before I moved to Hong Kong. But it was the marriage of kind of Alibaba wanting to transform this great old brand, the South China Morning Post, into a digital platform to become a worldwide organization. And Gary has spearheaded that. And I have to say that in the last 18 months, I've read more SCMP than I have read since I lived in Hong Kong. Wow. So it's really That's been, encouraging. Um, well, it's because you took down the paywall. But <laughs> yeah, it was cheap. No, we I actually, can't take we credit actually, for that. But we actually had a, a subscription anyhow. So uh, you could still, I can't say you that. You could still pay us if you want. <laughs> We'd be happy to take that We money. read your advertising. We click through <laughs> on the advertising. So you, you, you get the revenue. But it's, it's terrific to have you here. This is going to be more in the form of a Q&A. So uh, if you would just kick it off and tell us kind of why you went from this great life in the United States back to Hong Kong to work on this transformation and kind of what your vision is for SCMP and then I'll ask you some questions. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. It's always great to spend some time with the National Committee when we are in New York. So let me tell you a little bit about myself for context and then we can talk uh, about uh, what the South China Morning Post is doing these days, what our mission is and what we uh, hope to accomplish over the next few years hopefully in as simple terms as possible. So uh, for me, the first thing I have to admit is that I'm not returning back to Hong Kong. So I'm very, Hong Kong is a new place for me. Uh, I was born in Southern California, in Anaheim, uh, which I get to go visit actually next week, which will be a lot of fun. Um, and I spent my childhood split between a couple of different places. My parents are born and raised in Taiwan. So I spent a couple of years there. And then I spent 10 years growing up in Auckland, New Zealand under the British education system, um, and which is the only reason why I know where a salad fork is supposed to sit when I'm at dinner. <laughs> and then I moved back to the United States uh, for high school. And since the age of 14 until uh, I moved to, to, to Hong Kong, so nearly 20 years, I've been mostly on the Northeast, or in, uh, in this area of the world. I consider New York City to be my home, although I'll have to admit that high school was in New Jersey. So you have to excuse me for that, uh, but we love New York City. My wife uh, is also grew up in New Jersey from when she was one uh, and, uh, and considers New York home as well. Like Steve said, I grew up in my career in the tech industry. So I went through the succession of Google, AOL, Spotify. And then right before I left for Hong Kong, I was the CEO of a news aggregation platform here based in New York City, a small startup called dig.com, D-I-G-G. -G. That was once very, very impressive and very important, went through a second life, and uh, we were in the process of turning that business around as well, which I, I thought we did a pretty good job of it. Um, but then I got a very unique call, a uh, very unique opportunity to move to Asia, to go to Hong Kong and, and learn about a new city and, uh, and take over a, story to news organization that was in uh, transformation. Okay. Um, and at the end of the day, as I was explaining to Steve earlier, there are really two reasons, one practical and one personal. 
The practical reason is that, is that in the world of news, there are very few opportunities like this. In fact, in a generation, there are probably going to be very few opportunities like this. A, a news brand with as, as, uh, as dense of a history, as important of a history as the South China Morning Post, with the opportunity and the resources and the intent of crossing a technology ch chasm to become globally relevant um, at a time where the story of China is of increasing importance, that opportunity is hard to say no to. And secondly, more personally for me, having grown up in largely the Western world uh, with an ethnically Chinese background and, uh, and, and, and having been part of that culture and understood it well and, and speaking the language, I've always felt like if there was, a, there was a gap in understanding and that gap, unfortunately for me, I saw was growing and not decreasing. Uh, and having an opportunity personally to participate mm -hmm. and hopefully helping bridge that gap and elevate the level of thought and understanding and discussion between the East and the West, for me, was very personal. The idea that my future kids, who are almost certainly going to be global citizens, could possibly grow up in a world of greater mutual understanding, of greater mutual cooperation, um, that I necess didn't necessarily get to see, and although I do know that even my generation had a much better than in the past, uh, was something that meant a lot to me. So for those two reasons, uh, my wife and I picked up uh, our roots here in New York and moved to Hong Kong about a year and a half ago. And my wife, who made the much larger sacrifice, her family is still here in New Jersey. Her, uh, she's a pediatric dentist, so she had a practice in the Lower East Side that she had to sell, uh, and now is no longer practicing because Hong Kong makes it difficult for uh, foreign medical professionals to practice. She's still hoping, fingers crossed, knock on wood, that she'll pass all the licensing exams. So she really um, is a participant in all of this, uh, an important participant where she believes also in the mission of what we are trying to accomplish at the SCMP and has decided to come along and, and, uh, and be a great partner in this adventure. Now, to the SCMP, to the post. What on Tell earth me are we doing? Who called? Uh, that's a that's a very unexciting story. It was an executive headhunter. Oh, it was a headhunter. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. Joe Tsai or Jack Ma. No, my goodness, um, <laughs> that would have really shocked me. I'm not sure I would have believed it was either of them. I probably would have hung up the phone. Uh, uh, no, it was uh, it was an executive recruitment firm that understands the media space quite media space quite well. Clearly, not well enough to realize that they shouldn't have recommended me, but. Um, they did, and I went through a series of conversations with the incumbent CEO who was leading the search for his replacement uh, and uh, got to meet the team who are, I mean, absolutely exceptional. The team, the leadership team we have both on the editorial and the business side in Hong Kong is world class. Uh, and after meeting that team, it became apparent that we would actually be able to accomplish these grand goals that the organization had. Should I get to the grand goals? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> The mission of the South China Morning Post is dead simple. It is to lead the global conversation about China. It's dead simple to say and repeat, extremely difficult to actually execute on. Um, and, and we are a news organization that is struggling with the same things that every other news organization in the world is struggling with right now. The discovery mechanisms for content, especially news content, the user behavior around news content, all of that has shifted so dramatically in the last 20 years. And unfortunately for our industry, we didn't pay attention for the first 15 of those 20 years. And we let other people disintermediate our entire stack. And we used to be able to collect news how we thought was right, to be able to package it in the way that we wanted to and distribute it the way we wanted to. And everybody's experience was controlled by us as a newspaper, right, start to finish. Every single level of that experience and that relationship with customers is now fragmented and platforms primarily own all of it. Uh, and increasingly so, we see platforms don't feel like it. they have an accountability towards media literacy, which is why media literacy around the world is degrading. And so in that environment, a news organization trying to turn around our business to go from being print-centric to digital first, which by the way, is just a means to an end. And that end is to become a global media organization, not just the paper of record for Hong Kong, although that remains of primary importance for us, but the paper of record for Hong Kong, as well as the global source on, uh, on China. That shift, that parallel shift of both technology and channel, as well as expertise and audience, uh, is what we are trying to attempt right now. And it comes with all of the uh, technology difficulties, the internal operational cultural structural difficulties, 
um, the distribution difficulties, the audience development difficulties, all of those things. So it's certainly a challenge. Um, we're not saying that we're definitely going to succeed, but I sh sure believe that we have a very good chance um, and we certainly have the right people to execute on that. So as the organization, now over 80% of our audience is outside of our home market of Hong Kong. So we're well on our way to be a, being truly a global media company. Um, and I'm talking about digital. Of course, digital isn't, I mean, it, it is just not even in the same ballpark as, as print readership at this point. So uh, like 98% of our overall audience is digital. Um, and, and our single largest marketplace is right here in the United States and is also the fastest growing marketplace for us is the U.S. Uh, as the appetite for understanding China better continues to grow, uh, you can imagine that uh, our importance of the audience here in the United States is growing, and we also have a primary focus on making sure that we create the right editorial and technology products to serve uh, this marketplace, um, and this marketplace to us being a proxy of the international marketplace outside of Hong Kong. So that is, I think, in relatively simple terms, hopefully, the mission and the goals of the STMP, and hopefully the next few years we'll have real stories of success to come share with all of you. What's your strategy in terms of getting news into China? Well, we have none because we do not exist in that marketplace. Uh, we are, and, and I assume you well, mean... Yes, yeah. another reason. Obviously not Hong Kong, but in mainland China. So right. we are 100% our news websites, um, all of them are 100% blocked in, uh, in China. And we, have, we really don't have any uh, printed paper distribution in China either. Um, and so, yes. Has it, excuse me, has it always been blocked? Is it's it been blocked for successful? quite a number of years. Approximately when did that start? Ooh, that's a really good question. It certainly was before my time. Um, I don't know exactly. Okay. So I think. Which has been since the. It's like been about 2011. Yeah. Some of the yeah. articles were blocked before then, but the consistent blocking. Yes. Okay. So, so we have, a, a, as a, from a company strategy point of view, um, we are not focused at all on that marketplace. There are plenty of people telling the story of the world to the Chinese market. That's not our value to the world. Our value and our, our unique value proposition t to the world is that we get to carry what's going on in China and in the region of Asia mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of the world, so we will focus on that. Yeah, so no, um, no Chinese language edition. No Chinese language edition. And no plan for a Chinese language no plan. edition. No plan. May I ask a question? And speak I loudly. Me, and I have a background a little like yours, American, spent time in Hong Kong, back here, New Yorker. Um, Best interpreter in the world. Wow. <laughs> Bar none. Yeah. Bar she, 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 she's interpreted for <laughs> Deng Xiaoping, Zhu <laughs> Rengji, <laughs> Zhang Zeming, Hu Jintao, so, so the difference between you and I is that no one will call me the best at anything <laughs> ever, so <laughs> that's great. No, but my question is, if you want to be the world leader in guiding conversations about China, how do you position yourself vis-a-vis -vis Voice of China, and how does China see what you're doing? Uh, let, let's be clear. Uh, we don't, we don't represent China. No, I, I understand. Right, but we um, also want to guide the conversation about China. Uh, guiding, well, we we, we want to lead it, as in we want to initiate the right kinds of conversation and provide a platform for that discourse to happen between people. So, w we don't assume, and nor do we claim that we uh, we know it all, or that we are the accurate perspective, or that we are, you know, that the exact and precise way to view China. We believe in a plurality of views. Our newspaper, our news websites, our overall conversational platform that we have built and are continuing to build on, uh, all represent that ethos, right, that belief of a plurality of views. And so our goal is to initiate it because we believe that we have an accountability and, and, and an opportunity to, to say this conversation and this increased understanding is important. Let us lead you into it and then have, have the conversation, then let you, let the participants have that conversation. So that is that is sort of the the the, um, the combined responsibility of both a news organization that leads, as well as a technology and product platform that allows for participation. And that's what we we will become. So I don't know Voice of China well, besides from our own reporting of understanding what uh, what China is trying to do with all of their different media units and divisions and departments. Um, but I think that our 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 role. Um, and certainly the way that we see objectivity, the story of China, is vastly different. What does it mean to have Alibaba as your owner? 
a company that has enormous business interests in China, yeah. whose one could imagine a situation in which <laughs> reporting by, and you're a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of Alibaba. I mean, de minimis would be an argument, but you would well, have- Well, thank you for that confidence. <laughs> 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 Look at their market cap yeah. and the value of SCMP. Yeah. I mean, it's just the state, it's not a, it's not a, yeah. hopefully one day you'll be- Maybe, the, maybe. You'll yeah. be a huge part of Alibaba, but I don't think they believe that. Okay. The, <laughs> but it, you have the potential to upset the output card. How does that affect your reporting? It doesn't, and I, it won't, it will not. That was a weird, it will not. Um, it, Alibaba, at the point of acquisition two years ago, made it very, very clear that they not only believe in, but are going to sacrosanctly protect editorial independence. And you can, everyone in this room has a right to believe or not believe their words, but I can tell you, pay attention to their actions. And I can tell you, certainly in my year and a half, um, in the role of CEO and watching their actions on a daily basis, they have backed it up. They have not come into the newsroom. They have not dictated editorial line. Um, they have not only left us alone, but protected editorial independence and continue to do so. What it means to be owned by Alibaba is that we are one of the few news organizations in the world that has the resources and the patience to cross this chasm that all others are dealing with right now. The economics of our industry are completely broken. They're broken because high quality journalism is expensive to create, but no one is willing to pay for it anymore. And by the way, yes, there has been a quote unquote Trump bump in subscriptions, especially in the United States. And the New York Times and the Washington Post are touting these numbers of, yes, we're seeing growth in digital subscription and, and we're gonna do fine. Listen, it was a bump from 2016, well, between 2016 and 2015, that was the difference. In 2017, what the news industry did was maintain that bump, but it, it already plateaued after one year. And so the reality is that our industry is still in distress. Okay? We are still trying to figure out how to actually bridge that gap between how much it costs and how much people are willing to pay for it. And, uh, and we are fortunate that we are able to invest in people, right? invest in the right kinds of journalism, invest in the technology, and invest in long-term thinking in a way that many news organizations cannot. That's what it means. What qualifies you to lead the discussion in China? That's a very good question. Here's what we believe. <laughs> we believe that uh, we are in a very unique position, that we are not only English language uh, news organization with 115 years or nearly 115 years of experience reporting on Hong Kong and China, uh, but we are still based and we will always be based in Hong Kong, protected by the independent judiciary, protected by the, the freedoms of press that are, exist in Hong Kong. And we have of global newspapers, and I'm, I'm carving out uh, wires for a second here because of course they serve a different purpose. Of global newspapers, we believe we, we have the largest presence inside of mainland China when it comes to reporting resources. We're not saying we're gonna cover it all. This is, by the way, that mission statement is, as you can believe, as you can imagine, is aspirational. But we believe that we have a unique position where on a daily basis we write around 100 articles uh, about Hong Kong and China whereas other leading global news organizations on a good day may write four or five. So the comprehensiveness of our coverage is, and, and, and the objectivity of our coverage is what we believe allows us to say, we can lead and initiate that conversation. What do you say about the, I think there's a lot of discussion in the United States about a diminution of press freedom in Hong Kong that there's increasing self-censorship in newsrooms and on editorial boards. How do you respond to that? I am the wrong person to represent the Hong Kong media space, not only because I'm very new to Hong Kong. I have no history there. I certainly have no history in the media industry there besides my year and a half in this position. And s secondly, I, I think the South China Morning Post is in a very unique position because we are an English language newspaper that is pointed outward. And we're not accessible in China. And so I, 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 we are not the same as the Chinese newspapers in Hong Kong. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that there are limits on press freedoms with the Chinese newspapers. I'm just saying that we're not part of that space. We don't, we, we don't pretend to represent it, and I would, I'm the wrong person to ask. But here's what I would say as an observer, okay, as, a, as a news consumer. 
New York is home. We have eight million people here. And we believe that this is a vibrant, that this is still the center of the media world. Well, us New Yorkers believe we're the center of everything, but this is the center of the media world. With eight million people, we, in this town, we have three newspapers that really matter. We have the Times, we have the Journal, we have the New York Post. In Hong Kong, seven and a half, I know people will disagree, this is, that's a personal opinion. <laughs> In Hong Kong, seven and a half million people, you want to pay attention to the media space in Hong Kong, you're reading 20 different news sources, at least 12 different daily newspapers. So I think the vibrancy of the Hong Kong media landscape just by that metric and just watching these debates and arguments that are constantly happening between the news organizations and the Hong Kong government um, about every which way, like every issue, that to me, I see vibrancy. I see life. I see a fight for press freedom. And I'll tell you, the South China Morning Post will always be on that side of the argument that we will stand up and protect press freedom with everything we have, with all the backbone that we've built in the city of Hong Kong because it is incredibly important for our civic society. So Jan Barris with the National Committee. Um, following Johnson's question, because there's part of it that you didn't answer. So there may be all this vibrancy and perhaps freedom, but what about the issue of self-censorship? Mm -hmm. Because even in a vibrant, hopefully free place, people are thinking about, well, what might happen if I write this story? So. Do you have discussions about this yeah. at, um, within internally within the paper? Our senior editorial leadership is very, they, they, they are precise in the way they operate. And one of the key concerns is that there could be self-censorship in the organization. So they're constantly monitoring and making sure that we have the systems and the structure and the discipline set up so that doesn't exist. One of the ways that we are trying to ensure this is that we have, by design, I would believe to be one of the most, if not the most, international senior editorial leadership teams in the world. So our top seven editors, including our masthead leadership, um, are, are from seven different nationalities. And, and I would actually challenge anyone in the room to find a news organization with that kind of diversity. Uh, and that keeps us accountable. We have also <laughs> created incredible transparency in our news organization. I think a lot of you may have I've heard about the, the, the brand new headquarters that we just moved into, which was designed for the sake of expressing our values, one of which key values is transparency. At the very, uh, in our newsroom, there's a two floor atrium, and in the center of that atrium uh, is an oval desk, which is occupied by all of our senior editors. So about 20 or 18, actually, I don't know, it's, I, it's, I think between 15 or 18 of them sit together in this oval desk. And if you come into our office, it's one of the first things that you'll see you'll be able to watch them operate at any time. Our entire newsroom walks past them to go anywhere to go to the bathroom. You can't help but walk past masthead leadership. And every single day, the news agenda is set right there out in the open. It's not a closed door situation. The news meeting happens in an open room where anyone, visitor or staff, is able to walk in. And at any point in time, our news organization knows that they can are, and are encouraged to challenge senior editorial leadership if they believe that there are any issues with self-censorship or non-objectivity in our news coverage. So we pay close attention to this, and I believe that we have the right leadership, and we have the right systems, and the right structure, and the right cadence to remain an objective news organization in reporting on China. You know, uh, this is not passing the buck, but at some point, Steve, uh, I, I wanna make sure that we send our executive editor, Chao Chong Ying, or our editor-in-chief, Tammy Tam, to come here and do another one of these, and you guys can grill them on it, because uh, you'll probably believe them a little bit more than you'll believe, believe me, you. and they'll probably, uh, they'll probably be able to give you more details about how they operate and lead the newsroom. Who's your competition, and what, are the, what may stop you from realizing <laughs> your vision? Um, our competition, <laughs> it, that's, hard to, that's actually hard to answer. Maybe it is the lack of education about Asia and the American education system. Maybe it's that. I don't know. But um, I, I do that'll think that. That'll stop you from real. That's not your competition. That'll stop you from realizing your goal. Yeah, I, I think that that is part of the problem that we're trying to reverse is that, I, again, I, I went through a, a, the formative part of my education um, here in the United States. And I know that I was way undereducated mm -hmm. on the importance of Asia and Asia's role in, uh, in global history, um, and certainly that of China. So I think that our competition right now is that um, there is difficult access 
I, I know I'm not going to be the answer you want. I know that you want me to say the New York Times, or the, uh, but but that's not the case, right? The, the case is that to understand China, you need to read China Daily, the New York Times, and the South China Morning Post, along with many others. You need to have all of those perspectives to get all the nuance and all the texture. All of us together right now with all of our resources and all of our focus can't cover this country properly. And we can't cover the rise and the impact that it has on the world properly. We're getting better at it because actually there's, there's, much, more, uh, there's mu much more reportage and reporting uh, about the country increasingly so. Um, and so our uphill battle, of course, is with the changing dynamics of information distribution and, and misinformation. But part of it is a uh, battle is a marketplace that doesn't yet know how important it is to understand China, that everything, that, that China's policies impact our day-to-day -day lives here in the United States, impact prices of the consumer goods that we buy, impact the futures of our careers, impact um, you know, the, the, the way that w our government um, relates to other governments that are not China, all of these things, I think we just, we, we, we have to fight against this inertia of thinking that it doesn't matter. How often do you go to China? In 18 months, I have been into chi mainland China twice, so not a lot. But how large is your staff there? You uh, between 30 to 40 in any given day. Yeah. Countrywide? It, 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 yes, but then of course uh, headquarters in Hong Kong has right. about no, 900 people. Not, not, yeah. not so I assume you don't communicate then with the State Council Information Me Office? Me personally? Or the I South do. China Morning Post? With yeah. the State Council Information Office or the Propaganda Department of the Chinese Communist this Party? This very sincerely, department. very sincerely is, is more of a question for Tammy and Chung Yen. We have, just like any other news organization, sources throughout the authorities. We have relationships with people throughout the central authorities. So I cannot blanket say that we have no communication with people in those organizations because some of them are, are part of our news reporting process. So I'm the wrong person to, to answer that. And yeah, I'm, I'm frankly the wrong person to answer that. Do you think that a lot of people but, talk but about- But very quickly, I, I do want to say this. The editorial agenda and the editorial voice and the editorial line of the South China Morning Post is defined by our editorial leadership in Hong Kong. I want to make that absolutely clear. We have visits from both the Hong Kong government and folks who are part of the democracy movement in Hong Kong. And the folks from the democracy movement will say that rule of law is being eroded in Hong Kong, that press fee freedoms are being eroded in Hong Kong, and that you see it every day. And the future is actually not very bright. How do you respond to the democracy movement in Hong Kong? Because I'm sure they say that when they're here, and they say that every day in Hong Kong. How do I respond to the democracy movement in Hong Kong? Um, well, I mean, our position as a newspaper is that we report on it. We don't shy away from that topic. We don't shy away from the complexity and the intensity of discussion and argument that exists in Hong Kong around uh, around the, the, the issue of elections, everything that came to head in 2014 during the Occupy Movement and everything that continues to happen um, as a residual and ripple effect of that even to this day. And I believe that our coverage of it uh, is, is, uh, is, is very balanced on both sides of the argument and we're gonna continue to do that. I have to say that the, this was before you were there, that the South China Morning Post reporting on the Occupy Movement was extraordinary and quite different from what the Western reporting was on the Occupy movement. It was much more nuanced, much more in depth, much more talking to local police officers as to what's going on, talking to the protesters, really giving folks a, an understanding of what actually went on and left you, left me at least, with very different conclusions from what readers of not your competitors, but the New York Times, the Washington <laughs> Post, and the Wall Street Journal concluded. It really was, it was quite different, especially the interview with the superintendent um, who ordered the, um, the firing of the, of the tear gas, I guess. Well, that's the advantage of being there, right? Being in Hong Kong, 
in mainland China, the fact that we are there with lots of people and that we are a newspaper who is dedicated to this type of expertise and coverage, we can publish 10 articles a day about what's going on on the ground. We can publish all the different points of view. When you're the New York Times, when it comes to Occupy, as an example, you know, once every week you get to publish that one wrap-up article on what is going on, you can't, it's just impossible to express that nuance uh, when it's one article a week. What's your mechanism for keeping track of what's happening in the internet in China? We, we have a lot of people that are watching it very, very closely. Not only um, our researchers in mainland China, but also our newsroom in Hong Kong as well. We report a lot on the, the censorship issues um, and, and the, 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 the multiple different censorship issues that exist across the internet and distri distribution channels of information in mainland China. That is part of uh, our, our daily coverage. That is because of the fact that we are paying very, very close attention to it and we care deeply about it. What was interesting is, is I told this story earlier, is that I gave a talk in Wuhan at the World Internet Conference uh, last year where, as I have said to every Chinese official I've met with and say publicly, where I criticize the Chinese government for blocking Facebook, for blocking Google, for blocking Twitter, for blocking YouTube. Mm -hmm. I say ultimately China, in order to be a responsible stakeholder, needs to allow the Chinese people access to this under terms acceptable to China. And I gave the speech, and generally the Chinese media reports on every speech I gave in China. And in this one, it was as if I wasn't at the conference. There was no reporting whatsoever of my speech. In fact, when they talked about attendees at the conference, my name wasn't there. So I, it was a little surprising. The South China Morning Post, to its credit, put it on the front page and put exactly what I had said on uh, in the in the paper. So it worries me that you're surprised by that, because I, isn't I know, that I'm what a news surprised. organization no, should no, actually no, do? No, no, <laughs> well, well, come on, wait a minute. You yeah. should not be surprised by that. My name is Chris Merck, and I'm with the Harvard Yangtze Institute and a number of other nonprofits. It is a fact that the South China Morning Post is a rescue operation. It was in decline for a long time under Malaysian ownership, mm -hmm. in which the people who really reported on what was going on with China one by one can name some of them, Lily Lam, et cetera, et cetera, Thank were exiled, and the quality of the coverage declined steadily. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say, in the last, um, you know, a couple of years uh, since uh, Jack Ma came in, the quality of the coverage has improved. But this is a rescue. This is not a transition due to the economics of the, of the news business. This is an institution whose, whose journalism standards were declining, which was patently subject to self-censorship uh, from aided and abetted to press by the ownership. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with what Alibaba is doing so far with it. But, um, you know, I think, I think it's always good to know exactly where you're coming from. Um, I've been reading the paper since 1965 when I lived in Hong Kong for two years. At that time, it was a paper of record for the English-speaking residents mm -hmm. in the government and others, not, not for 95% or more of the population who read the Chinese newspapers, I would not have considered it a paper of record in the last 10 years or 15 years of Hong Kong. And I wonder in what sense you consider it the paper of record <coughs> today. Um, and then I have a bunch of other questions. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't know what you expect me to say in response to that question. Um, I think well, that it's not my slogan; yeah. it's your slogan. Yeah. We are the paper yeah. of record. For we Hong are. Kong. Uh, I know what the New York Times yeah. means when they say yeah. that, and they have a you know a reasonable claim to that status in the United States. When you say that about the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, what do you actually mean? I will tell you this: from a metrics point of view, there are in in in, in Hong Kong, seven and a half million people. There's a two million addressable marketplace of, of English language consumers. This is, and this is still, you know, everyone in the government um, is, uh, is, is, a, is a consumer. We capture 99% of that readership on, an, on a monthly basis. Uh, and so in that sense, everyone who reads English language in Hong Kong, including, the, including leadership and in government, in, uh, in law, 
in the legal systems, in the business uh, sectors, in education. We are the paper that they read. And the competition would be the standard. And in that case, I agree with you. It's a better, it's a better <laughs> newspaper than the standard, certainly. But if, if I were saying, OK, SCMP versus Ming Bao versus Da Bong Bao, which is more important, I would say we're, we're ranking number three, at least. We will disagree Amongst on that. the majority of the people, yeah. given that the majority yeah. of people are not. Uh, the, the reality is our, our penetration in Hong Kong now is greater from a percentage of population than it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. And yes, it, and so the argument is if you're saying that the newspaper was a paper record 30, 40 years ago because the people in government and in leadership and in, in, in control of the city read our paper and that was a small percentage of the population, I absolutely want to claim that now. I can tell you for a fact that that is still absolutely the case. And in fact, we have even greater influence because we have higher penetration across the overall population. <coughs> sort of a Mutt and Jeff type yourself. question. Uh, Douglas Murray uh, hit the National Committee in various ways over the years. Um, the South China Morning Post and China Daily, they coexist. Do they pay any attention to each other? Do, they, do we pay, in what sense? I read the China Daily on a daily basis because I want to know what Beijing wants the world to know. But that's, that's the extent of our relationship. Do you have any professional connections? No. No partnerships, nothing. No, pro no professional no, no, no connections. Partnership, but there's a community of, of journalists who you would expect to interact. I'm just asking, do they? Do they interact? Uh, I actually don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh -huh. um, the, the China Daily... Uh, the journalists for China Daily don't ever come onto my, my, my radar, so uh -huh. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe we run into each other, and, and I mean, I'm sure we run into each other in the field, our reporters, along with China Daily's reporters, um, in Hong Kong, in, well, in other places too, but no, there, is, there, there are no formal relationships between the two publications, and there won't be any formal relationships between the two publications. No, I didn't expect yeah. any formal relationships, yeah. but the world of journalism is big enough for both, but they don't mix. They don't mix. I mean, our, 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 the way that we approach journalism and what the object, objective picture right. of China looks like uh, is, is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, David, you are president of the Old China Association. Um, spent a long time living in Hong Kong and reading the post for a long time. Um, I was interested in, in sort of the other side of stated a big ambition of wanting to be globally read and a better presence in the United States. What is your strategy to become well known? Mm. I lived in Hong Kong until I got to know the Post. Yeah. Everybody read the Post in the room that Steve was here. Uh, but in the, across the United States, yep. there's been very little known, even in, across New York. It's not one of the papers most people are aware of. Um, I was interested in your, um, your assertion that you're in a unique position Again, so be careful of the language here, yeah. <laughs> an amplifier of information on China or something like that um, because of your location and your history. But how do you become well known enough yep. so that people even know that you're here? So this is where you can, everyone in this room can, uh, can accuse me of being incredibly mille millennial in the way that I view the world. I'm a product person. That is my background in the technology world. That is what I'm bringing that I believe is unique into the news industry. And so I think about this as a product problem. The reason why newspapers no longer have uh, the the one-on-one -on -one relationship and the control of our relationship with our re readers is because we've allowed somebody else to make better discovery and make better <coughs> products. So to solve this, it is a product issue. Now for us in the United States, we know that the South China Morning Post is not a well-known brand. We know that the South China Morning Post, even if people do know it, um, is, well, when, when people see the brand, the South China Morning Post, if they don't understand our history, if they don't understand what we've represented in the past, if they don't read our product, the full main book from front page to back page every single day, just the word China will, will lead to assumptions that are incorrect. So we were not tied to the historic brand. We care about it deeply, but we were not tied to the brand in our push into this marketplace. 
So our strategy is that we have built new products under product brands, and we are in no way, shape, or form hiding the South China Morning Post brand, but we've built new products under new product brands that serve this market. As an example, we've just launched a new product called Inkstone. That is the product brand. That is what, in your engagement and relationship with us, with the SCMP, a lot of people are going to be engaging with the product and the brand Inkstone. What is Inkstone? It is simply six pieces of content a day that helps elevate your understanding of China. Some of those six are current events, things that happened in the last 24 hours. Some of those six are contextual. And what we are doing is we get to leverage our enormous, well, enormous large newsroom uh, reporting on China, and we get to repackage and contextualize what exists on scnp.com for an international marketplace for American readers who are curious about China but don't really know where to start. Right, in the SCMP, when I talk about Politburo Standing Committee, when our, uh, our journalists write about Politburo Standing Committee members, we can use the name without having to provide context as to who they are. Here in the United States, we can't, certainly not with that demographic. And it's it certainly, we are not, I'm not, that Inkstone is not a product for the people in this room, okay? I get it. So, <laughs> okay, so, so that's what we're trying to do. And so we are, we are trying to build um, a product that will help people who raise their hands, and we know that there is an increasing number of these folks who raise their head, hand to say, I'm globally curious, and now I understand, I, I know that China is important for me to understand better. I don't know where to start. Inkstone, here's the product for you. So if you look at the product, the user experience is very different than scmp.com. It's very different than most news products in the world. It is targeted at a different demographic with a different use case. So we're trying to solve this issue through product. And we have multiple others that have either already been launched or are coming. All focused on China, some aspect of China. Yes. We have another one that is also launched in this marketplace called Abacus, because we believe that the Chinese tech industry is massively underreported on, right? Uh, and that the innovations coming out of China and also the concerns and the issues coming out of China in the tech industry are worth exploring. And we do know that there are plenty of technologists around the world who want it but don't have access to it. They have some sources of commodity news, so when the big companies, BAT, invest in some company or, or uh, there's, uh, you know, somebody goes and lists on uh, either Hong Kong, Shanghai, or New York, um, then that news will be in other global technology news sources. But in-depth inside analysis and understanding of who these people are and what these companies are and what the innovations are in China and what the concerns are about censorship and about, uh, about monitoring all these things in China, there's, there, there's not a lot of places with consistent high quality news. And so Abacus serves that need for technology. Is that a daily? That is, uh, that is different than Inkstone. So it is whenever we have news, we publish it. Yeah, so that is more of an ongoing feed of, so you of go news. On the SCMP site and you subscribe to Abacus? No, you go to abacusnews.com. It is, again, a separate brand. Um, and uh, and we're, we're focused on growing that brand in international markets as well. And do those brands uh, benefit from the Alibaba role? Uh, no, not right now. Yeah, no, no, we don't. Um, so that's a brand. Yes. Sorry well, <laughs> I just wondered if there's any way that you get to ride that coattail. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, but it would also probably affect our objective reporting on Alibaba. So no, we, we don't. Um, <laughs> our relationship with Alibaba's PR team is really, really, f it's, it's quite funny at times. Um, we're told often that, uh, well, we find out a lot about a lot of Alibaba news by reading it on the wires or when it breaks on the journal, and then we'll ask why we weren't part of the initial, uh, the initial you know, embargo pitch, and we'll be told that we have to earn our place at that table. <laughs> and it's true. Do, it's do you true. disclose in every article um, we do. about a Alibaba that you yeah. are owned by Alibaba? Yeah, that is standard news practice, and right. organizations like ours have to, yep. should. Because yeah. CNBC, they're always, whenever they're reporting on uh, Comcast, they're yeah. always saying, well, we're, of course, this is our parent company. Um, hi, Alexa. I'm going to be a journalist in China. Um, a couple of different questions. One, could you talk a little bit more about the firewall issue between you and Alibaba? You know, Alibaba is so massive. Mm -hmm. So many joint ventures and yeah. so many subsidiaries. And you can't, you probably can't mention the fact that in every single article, I mean, you do when you're talking about Alibaba. We try, yeah. Um, 
Can I, can I just go one at a time? Yeah. Terrible memory. You go to a second question, I'm not going to answer either of them well. Uh, on the first one, structurally, the firewall, our governance structure is that I report into a board with Alibaba folks and non-Alibaba folks. We are very unique in that, in that way, in, in the Alibaba uh, family of companies, because everyone else reports into, anyone that's wholly owned, certainly, reports into a division of Alibaba. A lot of people assume that there is, Alibaba has a media division. We do not report into the media division. We're separate. As, we have our own board. Um, and that was by design because of editorial independence. So we do not take any uh, instruction whatsoever. My relationship with my board, and I think that this is why they trusted me as a startup and technology guy to be able to lead this company as chief executive. My, my relationship with the board is that uh, once every year I go, like if I'm fundraising, with an annual strategy and an annual plan and a budget and go raise money from Alibaba, from the board, right? right? Um, and I have, at least right now, been two for two, which is great, great news for us, uh, and raise the money that we believe we need and then we go and operate independently. I meet with the board only one other time per year as a mid-year review to make sure that our metrics are going the right direction, uh, that our products are being launched on time, that there are no major critical issues with personnel or whatnot. So uh, that's our relationship with our board, and that's our primary relationship with our owners. Hopefully one day you'll be making money, and you won't have to go to that the That would be nice, <laughs> wouldn't it? And we have every- <laughs> You've got to go back every year. That's going to yeah. be a problem after a few years as a former owner. Well, so first of all, yes, that is our aspiration, is that we will, in, in, in X number of years, and I'm not going to reveal the X, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, become self-sustaining. Um, but I'm also, being a startup guy, very, very used to asking for money, and I've gotten very good at it over the years. Um, so, so join our board? <laughs> uh, I certainly am way too underqualified for that. So with regard to coverage, and it's a very interesting question you ask there, um, the, the firewall is very strong between our organization and PR and information um, uh, coming out of Alibaba. We s are completely off of the Alibaba employee systems, completely separate employee, employee systems, so that there is no access to internal, potentially proprietary information. Uh, and again, by design, and very, very important for a news organization like ours to have those kinds of firewalls set up. In our reporting, when we do mention Alibaba, to say that Alibaba owns the South China Morning Post, that happens when we feel like it's important to, 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 to mention Alibaba in the story. So, um, so, so yeah, so if it's an investment, if the investment by Alibaba is large enough for Alibaba and that ecosystem to actually matter, uh, then we will mention the fact that Alibaba owns the South China Morning Post. So the editorial team has very, very clear guidelines on that as well. How do you measure? So the three areas we have primarily spent on, uh, number one is uh, editorial. So we have grown our newsroom significantly since, well, in the last 12 months. I think we've had 80 plus new hires in the last 12 months across our newsroom. And our newsroom is now, I think, 340 people. It will get to 350 in the next month or so. That's our target for uh, the first quarter of our fiscal year. Uh, and the second thing, also people, we have massively increased our technology expertise. So when I arrived uh, in January of 2017, we had 40 people and one team that covered both front-end consumer product, back-end infrastructure, as well as traditional IT, so serving literally our employees. Um, that 40-person team got split in two, and now we have 120 people across those two teams. So we've tripled the size of our technology expertise. And that's not even um, counting for... Uh, the, 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 the analytics and insights teams that we've hired, that we've built, as well as all of the technical expertise that now exists not only in the newsroom, but also across all the operating units. Uh, so massive investment in that. And the third one is building new product and launching them in new marketplaces. Of course, some of that is marketing spend, but a lot of that is executive and leadership mind share. Uh, and we are taking our resources and our time and spending a lot on figuring out what the needs are in the international marketplace and how we can best serve it. 
by which you measure whether or not you have achieved your goal? Yes. Great question. Um, three simple categories, reach, engagement, and impact. Reach is nice and easy. It's just scale of numbers. And uh, the platforms that we work with, our own internal data will allow us to see that pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. And growth has been significant. Although I'm not going to give you absolute numbers. Steve tried to squeeze that out of me earlier. I did not give, it, give in to him. But I will tell you that our overall online traffic has more than tripled in the last 15 months. And our international traffic used to be a little under 60%. Now it's over 80%, like I mentioned. The second one, engagement, is also easy to see. How many times people come back in a, in, in a week or in a month? What percentage of our user base are regular users? And we have a clear definition of what regular and loyal users look like. That's growing. It's growing steadily. I want to grow it exponentially. So that is something that we still have to work on. The amount of time on page is actually quite high for us compared to other news organizations uh, because I think that those who want to be engaged will read a lot. And so the recirculation, the number of page views per session, all these numbers are all trending in a very positive position uh, direction for us. The third one, impact, is a really, really hard one. And we still haven't figured out how to measure it properly. And we want to be responsible for this. I can throw out stats on the massive increase in citations that we've been getting. Right? And us being the backlink source of China news over the course of the last 18 months. And hopefully it is, to Christian's point, because the overall quality, not just the density, but the quality of our uh, reportage has improved over the last year and a half. But that it's in itself is not necessarily a, a, uh, an accurate, a fully accurate uh, or qualified indicator. Now we're trying to figure out other ways to measure it. Uh, we do care about exclusives and scoops. We think that one of the unique propositions we have is that because of our access and because of our understanding and our knowledge, we'll be able to provide exclusives in a way that others can't. So recounting how many exclusives we're able to publish. A lot of people ask me about breaking news, whether or not we want to own breaking news out of China. Outside of that world of exclusives and scoops, breaking news is something that in the commodity news world we live in in 2018 is going to be owned by other people. It's either going to be owned by social media, because even journalists now are, attending and, uh, are starting to break news by themselves under their own personal brand uh, to the absolute abhorrence of the news uh, platforms and news companies that they work for themselves. But also, um, the wires are, are, are just so precise and so good at this at this point. Our value, I don't think at the end of the day, will be to break news, commodity news, on a daily basis, but those exclusives and scoops and the deep insights analysis that, again, elevate our all overall understanding of what's going on. So that was a long-winded way to say for impact. I'm still not sure, and we're testing a bunch of things. And again, hopefully we will land on something that you guys would also agree with me on. Profitability is not a metric? I did not mention it, did I? You did not. I was. I quite, will say this. As a former investor, I was quite yeah. shocked. Yeah. <laughs> You um, would get a call from me tonight you would. if I was the owner. <laughs> you would. Oh, sorry, I would. So I would say this. Revenue matters to us. This is a real startup guy. I would, we talk about profits <laughs> in know, my yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. talk about revenue. That's the difference between traditional investors and startup investors. <laughs> you, you know us well. Um, we, have, we, have make, we, we have made a choice. Our ownership, along with our executive leadership, has made a choice to go into investment mode. That is a tech guy's way of saying we are unprofitable. That is a choice. We can be profitable because we still have very, very material top line revenue on an annual basis. So it's not like if we're not making any money, it's just we've decided to spend more than we're making because we want to invest faster in technology and in editorial and in new markets. That won't last forever. That can't last forever for two reasons. Number one, profitability is the only way to ensure that a news organization like ours is held self-accountable to the quality of our journalism. Because we need to make sure that you're willing to pay for it. Not just that you're willing to read it for free and know that your data is being sucked in by these ads and being monetized some other way. Is that you're willing to pay for it. I have to close that gap between how much it costs and how much you're willing to pay for it. So profitability or aiming for profitability keeps me accountable to quality. Number two, that's the only way to long-term commit to editorial independence. Okay, so that I don't go, have to go ask for a patron. So in that sense, I am acutely aware of the importance. And even though profitability is not one of our key measurements of success today, 
top line revenue and not atrophying when it comes to revenue generation and revenue growth, the discipline of revenue growth in our news organization is still of utmost importance for our leadership team. One of the things we do regularly at the National Committee when we're in Beijing is we gather uh, American journalists together and they brief our delegations. They don't actually ask our delegations stuff. They have like congressional staff, congressional How members. How do you manage others. to get journalists not to ask you questions? Well, we do we manage, we do manage. But because they have a real agenda with the groups we bring, which is to basically tell them about the difficulty that they have in reporting on China, that they will often recount stories that, you know, they go to up to Harbin and they get off the plane and they're invited for tea immediately after getting off the plane and their sources after they leave are questioned by um, uh, the local authorities as to what was discussed in an attempt to get them not to talk. How can you expand your coverage of China in that environment, question one? And question two is the number of reporters that you have limited by the Chinese government. Uh, you're asking for the number, that second no, question? No, no. Is it, is limited? it limited? No, so the two okay. questions is, in this environment, yeah. how do you become, how do you grow your business? Yeah. Um, and second, is your numbers, literally your numbers, yeah. limited the way the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Posts are? So um, I am, again, not the right person to be able to give precise answers on this, but I will answer it. We deal with the same conditions that everyone else is dealing with, with regard to reporting and access in China. We have to get the same visas through the same channels to get foreign correspondents into mainland China. Okay. Uh, so this is something that our managing, uh, managing editor and our, as a representative of our mass head leadership is also acutely aware of. It's something that we have to deal with. It is a situation and the conditions have changed over the course of the last year. And we expect that change to, uh, to, to, I mean, we don't expect it to change back. And so it's something that as a news organization, we are learning to, uh, we're learning to operate in, uh, in a new environment. Uh, but it's also not an environment we haven't seen before. Another advantage of having long institutional memory and having an organization that has reported on China for 115 years is that there are, there are uh, experiences um, and there, and we have journalists who've been with us for 30, 40 years who are able to still educate our younger class of journalists, our new journalists, on how to operate in those environments. Um, what we've loved as well, by the way, and this is, it's funny that we're looking to American press um, at times for that kind of, uh, for, for, for reminders, is at the start of last year, Steve Adler, who's the editor-in-chief of Reuters, uh, sent out a, a memo to his newsroom about the changing conditions of reporting in the United States as well, which have since January of 2017, um, I, I think, I mean, we, we've seen how it really, it, he wasn't exactly that prescient, he was just kind of narrating what was going on, but it has certainly continued. That memo reminded journalists in his newsroom uh, what it means to be a journalist, how to operate as a journalist, that, it, that we are not there to get handouts from, uh, from authority, that we are there to go and report. Um, and it was a good reminder for our news organization as well, um, not to say that we got complacent in our, in our uh, reporting, but certainly I think conditions, they do fluctuate, and it's a good reminder when conditions change how as a newsroom we have to continue to be good journalists. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, of course, ask them for interviews all the time. Um, and we often get interviews. We, we have opportunities to speak with them. Um, I don't know what percentage of them turn us down. And certainly, those change from situation to situation. They're certainly case by case. As we know, when we get to talk to officials on the record in China, 
it's because they have something to say. They have something that they want the world to know. Right? So our, our newsroom is well aware of that. That's, the, that, you know, that, that, that's how we operate. Um, and it's honestly not any different anywhere else in the world, but we also know that we have to contextualize any of those interviews properly. Honestly, we have, I believe that our reporting and our access to officials for things that matter, um, if you read our coverage on a daily basis, is quite comprehensive. It's quite comprehensive. It's certainly better than the, uh, some of the other global media players, most of the other global media players in China. Again, that's part of the advantage uh, that we have. First of all, we conduct a lot of those interviews in English, not all, sorry, in Chinese. Not all of, uh, of the global media companies can say that. Um, second of all, I believe that because of our Are history. Are all your reporters bilingual? Um, th the mass majority of them are. It is actually a, a requirement now um, for our reporting core in mainland China is to be bilingual. Okay. Uh, so uh, that is important. And increasingly, we are seeing, to our great delight, international journalists who have studied Chinese since high school uh, graduating from the world's great journalism schools and coming and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and working with us, which is a, which is, it's a, great, it's a great change in the environment. Um, so I, now I, I totally forgot what I was going to say. Um, oh, and, and it really is over 100 years. I, I do think that we, we, do, we, we are a voice that is, is born out of Asia. And being a voice that's born out of Asia allows us more nuance and texture uh, than others. And officials tend to trust that more. So they do. If you were to ask, if we were to take, I don't know how anyone could possibly do this, but uh, uh, get a sense of trust level between Beijing officials and news organizations, I can tell you that we'll rank above other global media organizations. Um, and our access and their willingness to actually be interviewed by our reporters, not only in China, by the way, but here in the United States. We have, by the way, out of these three uh, microphones, the most dangerous one is a little tiny one <laughs> because it belongs to Rob Delaney, our U.S. correspondent. Um, and uh, I know that guy is going to catch me on everything wrong that I say and be the most critical person in the room about, my, about everything I say. But if you ask Robert, our access to those same officials here in the United States is also something that we pride ourselves for as well. And it does allow, you're right, it does allow us to tell part of the picture um, and, and in a way, in a format, um, in, in context that hopefully means you can, you, you're not always going to China daily for, for the story. What else do you have correspondents around the world other than Robert? So we have New York, we have DC um, in the United States, obviously a number of bureaus in mainland China, and we have reporters scattered around Southeast Asia, and we have a reporting corps that um, is able, willing, on the drop of a dime to travel. Uh, again, but no a privilege. No, no one, no one stationed in Europe. Um, Africa is something that we, the, 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 the China story in Africa is right. unbelievable. So we have sent reporters, we have worked with freelancers, uh, I would not be surprised if we decide to invest in a bureau in Africa in the next year or so. Uh, but again, b being based in Hong Kong, that incredible airport allows us to travel fast to anywhere in the world. One of our board members wrote a story on media inaccuracies in uh, Africa, well, relating to China. We only have time for one more. Sorry, Mostly John. because I have a dinner with my wife that, again, <laughs> if I am late for, I will be under more of a spotlight and more critique than the last hour you spent together. So, Kristen Green from the Institute of International Education, um, but I'm not going to ask about education. Um, is your model replicable? Is is your you know your defensible position your competitive advantage the model or is it the geography? Well, the geography is the model and it is unique. I think that if there is a model that we uh, ascribe to that is replicable across news organizations, it is expertise. Might be niche, but you can make money off of niche. You can be incredibly profitable off of niche. You can add value to the world, not by becoming the next New York Times, but being the expert on something that, that people care about. Because the internet, here's what the internet has done in democratizing information. It has made it so that there is no such thing as a niche topic anymore. When we used to say niche, it was because of, you know 5,000 people in the United States cared about it. There's no such thing as a 5,000 person community anymore. Any tiny specificity of topic and detail has 
followers and interest groups that are millions large, right? As an example, by the way, I came from Spotify, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, one of the stories I love to tell is that at one point, we were working with an artist on a very specific type of Eastern European wedding music. It's very random, and we thought, there's no way we're going to actually promote this type of music because there's not going to be a marketplace for this. And when we did release something to do with Eastern European wedding music, uh, we saw in the first week five and a half million people care about it. <laughs> no such thing as niche anymore in the internet. So if you have a subject matter expertise, you can become influential, you can make an impact, and you can be profitable. Gary, if this hour is any indication, the 115-year-old SCMP is really fortunate to have you as the CEO. But thank you so much for sharing this incredibly valuable information with us. Thank, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. That's great.